I had the opportunity to meet with Percival a while back and I always love when I meet with new people from industry or new people to me and we start to talk about what it is to be patient-centered. And I've learned over the years that everybody in the health ecosystem says they're patient-centered, but what they typically mean is if I could just get that damn patient to do what I want him to do, everything would be okay. Uh, when I spoke with Percival, he actually really got it. I was really yeah. pleased. Thank you. Can you describe for the audience what really motivates you sure. to do this? So um, I was born and raised in the Philippines and uh, came to the US when I was 16 for college. Um, I was raised by a uh, strong single mother uh, and three older sisters um, and had a phenomenal childhood. But uh, you know, growing up, you know, frankly, I, I don't remember a time, sadly, that my mother was, um, was not ill. Uh, and so you know, this shapes you as, as a child, uh, as an individual. And you know, it starts out as, as you being angry about seeing you know, what you see in the Philippines, the health disparities that exist, but also what caregivers go through. Uh, and this followed me throughout my career, um, starting with Roche and, uh, and finally now with Estellas. I think at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, how do we view patients? Are they essentially truly partners in, in what you're trying to do? Or as Mark was saying, you, know, you, you just wish that they, they listen to you and do as they're told, right? And I think this is you know, one of the things that um, we discuss a lot, and Estellas and, and my team knows this, is I think we're all shaped by the stories and, and the lives that we lead, and, and this is what motivated me from the get-go. Um, and Mark, in your case, you know, obviously you've been with the organization now for quite some time. What has motivated you to begin with? You know, it's remarkable how similar our stories are and how um, interesting that we converge here on the stage. Um, I, I grew up in a very rural part of Maine. Uh, most people didn't have running water or electricity. And in fact, we hauled the water in for the house from the lake. And we kept it in a big pot. Um, and I actually have that pot in my house with a plant in it as a reminder of where I came from. I left home when I was 13. I lived abroad and actually uh, had went to school, got a British law degree. I was all set to take a job in Belgium, working for the European community. I was really excited about it. And at that point in time, over a span of about two to four months, everyone in my family was diagnosed with one or more chronic conditions. And they range from heart disease, neurologic, autoimmune, cancer, uh, an ultra rare disease, and HIV. So I ended up coming back and living in Boston at the time so I could be close to my family and provide some family caregiving services. But over a period, again, of a very short time, each one of them lost their lives. And they lost it for different reasons. Half of them had no effective treatments for their conditions. And they just withered away and died. The other half had highly effective treatments, but the system couldn't make them accessible to them. And they died needlessly. So I watched as virtually every single member of my family passed away. Mm. And it really drove me to think differently about this. I began working with the patient community and had been committed to driving innovation so that we can get better treatments that speak to what's important to us, but also make them accessible for the people who need them in this country. Yeah. Really challenging. I, I'm curious. What is your philosophy on how we do this? You know, when I started my, um, my role, my current role in Estellas, I was very, um, I was very clear that I wanted to have a very distinct perspective for the organization and how we look at patient centricity. Uh, and so, for example, the, 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 the way we operate is based on three pillars. It's on patients, on people, and on performance. Mm -hmm. um, and everything that we do is focused on these three pillars. And you know, I'm a big believer that once, you know, if you have a singular tenacious focus on the patient and you have the right people in place, the performance will follow. And so everything that we do 
is really structured on these three elements. So the way we, we run our town halls, the way we run our town halls is very much on patience, on people, and on performance. We start with a patient speaker in every single town hall that we do. We then talk about all of the activities that we do to focus on the patient. Then we celebrate our people. And then only we talk about the performance at the end of the day. And it's this way of thinking that helps the organization rally around the importance of patient centricity. The way we structure our objectives, for example. So my objectives, I'm a firm believer that every single person in the, the organization has to have an aligned objective. So my objectives are linked to my direct reports and their direct reports and so on and so forth. So that every single employee in Astellas have a connection to my objectives and they're again focused on patience, on people, and on performance. And I think that's the approach and the philosophy that we have taken on as an organization and we've started to see some dividends to help people and employees really absorb and take to heart the importance of the patient in, in everything that we do. Um, you know, one of the things that we discussed as well was you know, your philosophy of a push and pull, right? And the importance of push when it comes to patient partnership uh, when it comes to drug development. And NHC has certainly been uh, a leading um, force in this, and particularly with PDUFA, the, the last PDUFA reauthorization. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Um, you know, I was surprised when I watched um, the survey that you conducted earlier, because I actually think, and I'll come back to this at the end, that uh, the Amazon, Google, Apple of the world are not going to be the disruption. I think everybody believes they are, but I think you're completely wrong. Um, and I'll tell you why, but what is really going to be the disruption in health is truly focusing in on the patient. And I know it scored low, and I think it may be because many of you are starting to shift. How many of you have um, objectives in your workplace dealing with the patient? Show of hands. If I had asked that question two years ago, there might have been one or two hands up. Uh, it's dramatically shifted. For us, we really focused in on uh, some pure basic health economics. Um, how many of you have studied health economics? Quite a few, good. So you'll know what I'm talking about, but I have to confess I've never studied health economics. But I do understand supply and demand. We decided about 10 years ago that we were going to create the demand for this. And it began in Purdue for five, continued into Purdue for six and 21st century cures, where we were able to work with the FDA to create guidances on how to do patient engagement, to reform how we look at patient reported outcomes, to begin to develop core outcome sets, not just for the regulator, but for the HTA body and the payer body. You're all now trying to figure out how you engage with people with chronic conditions. You're hiring up staff, you're creating departments, you're creating matrixed organizations to look at this. The demand is there. Now we have to create the supply. And so we're doing a tremendous amount of work to move the community to understand how they can work with you. We're developing a fair market value calculator for how you pay patients and patient organizations. We've created rules of the road with input from the FDA on how you engage patients. Tremendous amounts of resources have been developed. But most importantly, we have begun to work with the payer community, the HTA bodies, the quality developers, to start to look at how you incorporate patient engagement into the entire ecosystem. So the main pull that you're going to have is very soon FDA is going to send a product back that may be safe and efficacious, but say, where's the patient input data? When you go to a health tech assessment or an ICER for a value assessment, they're going to want to know what input do you have from the patient? Are you addressing an outcome that matters? And the payer community, who's getting focused on value-based outcomes contracts, they are going to want to know what value are you really providing to the patient that's going to help them live their life better, feel, function, and survive 
that is going to translate into value for them. Entirely different marketplace that you're moving into, but that's going to require that you do this from the front end. Yeah. How do we ensure if we do this, and I think we're going to get there, and you are really beginning to focus in on high value products that speak to the outcomes that matter to the people with the disease, rather than focusing in on the outcomes that surrogates said were important, you're focusing in on the outcomes that matter. How are we going to ensure that people get access to that? You know, it's the right time to talk about access because certainly it's, it's a hot topic these days and it should always be a hot topic. And, you know, without question, I think innovation is the bedrock, it's the foundation of who we are as a pharma industry. You know, we're, we're proud of the innovative therapies that we deliver to, to patients and we're proud of every single innovative molecule or, or um, technology uh, that comes to market. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I've always been a firm believer, and my team hears me say this all the time, is that innovation, frankly, without access is meaningless. Right? And so you can have the most phenomenal drug on earth, but if it's not reaching the right patient at the right time, you know, it, it was a good science experiment, right? mm -hmm. frankly. And at the end of the day, when we're talking about access, it's important that we have a very open, fair, balanced discussion about some of the issues that patients are, are feeling at the pharmacy counter, the out-of-pocket costs, right? And, you know, for example, we can talk about Medicare Part D, right? And whilst Medicare Part D has certainly benefited countless thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of seniors over the last 13 years, unfortunately, it hasn't progressed in, in terms of its um, benefit design as coping up with the innovation that's taken place. And so when you have um, a, a patient who is going through and past the donut hole into the catastrophic phase and the out-of-pocket cost is a sticker shock that they're feeling, there is something wrong with the way we've designed the system, right? And this is real. And so I know that certainly a lot of my colleagues in pharma have been quite hesitant to address the issue of access and pricing, but this is a real issue that all of us need to have a discussion with. And it starts with our industry to make sure that, first off, we price our, our products appropriately and fairly that demonstrates true value to the patient and society. But also, I think we need to stop finger pointing to each other, the PBMs, the payers, uh, the healthcare systems, the government, and pharma, and come together and have a, a fair, balanced, objective, um, free of rhetoric discussion that is important to really advance this along. And so I, I think, you know, just closing, when we're talking about innovation, and certainly I think innovation will continue to be who we are as an industry, it's important that we also talk about access, and that's why I personally have been very um, passionate about it. Um, and, and Mark, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is obviously the push and pull, and you've talked about the push component, right? But there's also a pull component when it comes to access. Um, and I know that NHC is a big proponent of this, and you've done wonders in terms of making sure that patients have access that they deserve. Can you talk more about that? So something really interesting happened in the last four years. Four years ago, our focus had always been about driving innovation and ensuring access. Over the course of the last several years in the United States, we've seen such a dramatic shifting of costs and the acceleration of utilization management techniques that if you're not of upper middle class and you have a chronic condition, you can't afford to see your specialist. You can't afford your biologic. You can't afford the necessary treatments you need. We've seen, even from patient organizations like the ALS Foundation, you know, a deadly disease for which there is no effective treatment, 
who has always said their number one issue was developing a new treatment or a cure, mm. say that I need access to care. Just basic care, I can't get it. We've seen a fundamental shift in the patient community, and we've been at the forefront on taking on drug pricing and healthcare costs, because the reality is in the US, everything is more expensive, not just drugs, but really looking to say where there's some accountability across the ecosystem and drive a new discussion about affordability, but at the same time, really push for meaningful access. Somewhere along the course of the last five years, our insurance model shifted to one where people with complex chronic conditions are subsidizing healthy people. When I have people who, for whom their first line of defense is a generic medicine, and they go in with their insurance card, and it's gonna cost them $120 to pick up that medicine at the counter, and they walk away. If they walk down the street to Walmart and pretend they have no insurance, they can get the same product for $20. We're not supposed to be subsidizing healthy people. The other thing that happened over the course of the last five years is we shifted from a minority of people with chronic conditions to a majority. Over 60% of the population has one or more chronic conditions. Over 30% of children have at least one chronic condition. We got to get back to a model where there's equity. You know, I sit on a board with the former commissioner of FDA, Rob Caleb. Great guy, but he points out very eloquently that we've been declining on all major health indicators in the United States. But it's only about 48% of the population that is declining. About 52% of the population is actually growing. But that 48% is so underserved that they're bringing down the national average. We have a huge equity issue. And for us at the National Health Council, our members, we're really focused in on how do we completely reorient the health system. We're in a state of tremendous change, potentially over the course of the next year, moving into chaos. But out of chaos creates opportunity and a real potential to get back to a place where people get access to high value care that speaks to what's important to them. That's our hope. Now I mentioned equity. I know you've been a big proponent of diversity. Can you share with the group your work there? Yeah, so um d &I, or diversity and inclusion, is one of the strategic imperatives that we have, and particularly for the Americas region in, in Estellas. Um, you know, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about this topic because at the end of the day, I think if we want to truly reflect the society that we serve, we need to make sure that we reflect appropriately um, the makeup of who we're serving. And that's why, for me, gender balance is very important. That's why, for me, it's very important to march with my colleagues in the Pride Parade in Chicago. That's why it's very important for us to fly the flag of, of transgenders during Transgender Week. right? And that's why it's very important for us to make sure that our leadership team is fully representative of a truly balanced, um, diverse, and inclusive organization. And that's why, for example, in every single town hall, I always finish my town halls by saying we need to be kind to one another because it's very important for me that we build a culture within Astellas that is truly inclusive at the end of the day. But I think it goes beyond you know, talent retention and acquisition and development. I think it goes beyond that. I think we need to, we still have quite a ways as an industry, Astellas included, to make sure that diversity and inclusion is transferred or, um, or yields um, quality patient experience. Right? Mm -hmm. There is a disconnect in what we're doing. Right? There is a gap. Right? And so I think there, there's still a long ways for the industry 
to make sure that we're truly representing who we want to represent, who we want to serve. And that's why for me, DNI has always been very important. And that's why for me, it is you know, one of the strategic imperatives for us. Um, you know, we've been here and, and talking about different ways that, you know, over the next uh, few days, different ways that companies can do better when it comes to patient partnership. Um, and certainly, as, as you mentioned previously, we're, we're trying different avenues on how to do this. What can companies do better then? There are two things I think companies can do better. One is you've got to figure out how to systematically integrate patient throughout your organization and patient organizations. So there's a lot of really good piloting going on. Um, tends to be in the clinical trial protocol development space or in developing a patient reported outcome. You need to think about how you integrate this systematically throughout the organization so that you're engaging at the front end and ensuring that you're getting at the right outcomes from the very beginning and integrating them. I am yet to see a company that has integrated this systematically and consistently through their portfolio. I'm starting to see companies that are beginning to develop some level of patient input data, at least at one point during the process. I haven't seen it consistently throughout the organization. That's your next step because that's going to lead you to the highest value product coming out the back end. It's also going to lead you to eliminating projects earlier on that are not going to be of high value. I'm always stunned from the companies how far you will go to keep a project alive, even when it needs to die. The last thing I'll say, and it goes back to the Amazon, Google, Apple, is they are not going to be the catalyst for innovation. What is going to be the catalyst for innovation are the mergers of companies like CVS and Aetna. CVS bought Aetna because it has the best data on what you are doing in your lives. How many of you have an Express Care card? Mm -hmm. And you get that ticker tape. You know what I'm talking about when you buy something at CVS? Now I see a few hands go up. They know everything about your shopping behavior. CVS bought Aetna because they want to combine that data with claims data and use that to segment their audience and market to you and get you the right health outcome. That's the future of healthcare. You need to have the products that work for those segmented populations. And you're only going to be able to do that if you engage with us in a systematic and consistent way. With that, I'm going to ask you, Percival, give us your concluding comments for this session. No, it's been a pleasure to be here. And again, thank you to Eifer Pharma for the invitation. Uh, you know, thanks to Mark as well for, for the discussion. You know, I think as much as we as an industry have done tremendous leaps and bounds in terms of um, being partners to patients. I think there's still a lot ways to go. I think there's still a lot ways to go in terms of what we can do, particularly on the development side, um, what we can do on the access side, mm -hmm. what we can do as, a, as an industry on diversity and inclusion. I think all of these hopefully will help the patients in the long run, but I think it's also good business sense. Uh, I think it, it makes sense for the business um, if it makes sense for the patient, and, and I think, you know, it's, 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 it's promising of what's to come, but it, it includes and it, it needs to include all of the different stakeholders and not just pharma. And, and that's where the partnership lies. Mark? Join me in thanking a truly inspirational, patient-centered biopharmaceutical leader. Thank, Thank you. you very much.